Base is dropped. I need to learn that in Spanish. I think now that we're traveling so much, uh, I don't know what Definitely. that is in Spanish. But the base is dropped in Monterey, Mexico, and in Atlanta, Georgia. Soccer down here. Wall Pass Wednesday edition, Match Day edition, Conca Champions edition. Atlanta United, Monterey tonight, ten o'clock kick. Uh, we've had all kinds of questions. It's the same viewing options as last round. It's Univision Deportes. It's Yahoo Sports and English streaming. We are on WAOK tonight, but you can still listen on the Atlanta United app. You can listen on the radio.com app. Just search for WAOK. We're on at 930 with pre-match coverage. Kickoff will be just after 10 o'clock from Mexico. The Estadio BBVA Banco Mare in Monterey. It's a uh, beautiful stadium. I got here a little bit late yesterday. Uh, I didn't get a chance to see it, but Mike was there for training. What do you think? Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it, it is uh it, it's right it's probably better than half the stadiums in the National Football League to be honest with you. It's uh, a little bit smaller than an NFL stadium, 53,000 seats, but uh this is going to be in a World Cup in 2026. It's part of the World Cup bid. They're going to host World Cup matches here. Uh, so they designed it with that in mind, and all the media facilities, all club facilities, the luxury boxes, it's all right there. And it's like we were talking about, I think, yesterday. This is going to feel like, for Atlanta United, what other MLS teams feel when they walk into Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Uh, you cannot replicate this, what they're going to see tonight in this stadium really anywhere else in MLS other than Atlanta and maybe Seattle, maybe, uh, if the upper deck is open. Uh, it's going to be a very intense atmosphere. They're expecting a sellout. Um, I know there are still some tickets left, but uh, they said they expect it to sell out because this is a very, very big game down here. But it's a beautiful stadium, and I can't wait to do the game there. I heard when we got here last night that I think they've sold 45,000 tickets already, and it's a 53,000-seater, so... They're expecting a big walk-up. That's pretty traditional in, in Mexico as a walk-up crowd. You don't sell generally 45000 ahead of time. That shows how big this game is being treated. I think this game's being treated big on the MLS side as well based off of last night's results. It was not a good night for the league. New York Red Bulls host Santos Laguna. Santos Laguna had to travel by like three or four different groups after their flight getting canceled. They got there late. They pretty much waxed the Red Bulls. Uh, Bradley Wright Phillips had some chances that he didn't convert. He said he owes the team some goals. I don't know if he's going to be able to find him next week in Mexico because they're uh, in a big trouble right now, losing 2-0. And Houston, after a good 45, we got to see a good bit of that. Um, they were looking pretty strong. They ran out of gas. They just hit the wall about the 70th minute, and you could see it coming. One goal was bad enough. The second goal is probably the one that's going to give Houston no hope in the second leg. John, I'm sure you had a chance to see uh, at least a good bit of both of those games. What do you think of both? Yes, and to answer your question, it is El Bajo Hakaido. Okay, i got to work on that. And so so that's that's how the, the show would have been introduced. But no, watched the Red Bull Santos Laguna match, and Jonathan Orozco stood on his head. And there was a reason he was given man of the match. And for all of the opportunities that Red Bulls tried to put on net, Orozco turned all of them away. And there was one sequence in the 30s, I want to say, from roughly 33 to about 39 in, in the minutes. And the game got stretched. And you could see that Santos was getting opportunities but then because they were pushing so many folks forward, Red Bulls were coming back in transition. Orozco had a nice double save that ended up being basically a save and then a kick save to thwart an opportunity. And pretty much the entire evening, Orozco was on top of everything that Red Bulls were, were throwing at, at uh, Santos Laguna. But Santos Laguna handled the press, found the uh, 
found the openings, found the passing lanes, and there was uh, the the first goal that I want to say was uh, in the early 40s, and it was a great deke that sent uh, Robles one direction, and then open up enough of a window to create the first goal. And then the second goal happened 47. So, you know, obviously you tip your hat to Santos Laguna for everything that they had to go through to just get to the building and coming out with a two, nothing win. And then for the night cap, you could tell that the dynamo were really trying to defend and, and do their best. But to your point, getting into the seventies and then the two goals that happened, I want to say in a four minute span to, get the, the goals on the board the the Quinones brothers really doing some tremendous work as they always as they always do so tall orders for teams you know and we, you know we talked about it yesterday Jason we thought that it might be a window for Red Bulls to to get something done against Santos they didn't and we figured that T Grace would probably get it done in Houston. I just didn't anticipate it taking 70 minutes before everything happened because that first 45, Houston had a couple of opportunities and not really uh, anything to, to shout about. I know that uh, Elise would like to have one back, but tall orders for the, the MLS sides after last night, now having to do things on the road in, in some of the tougher environments here in the hemisphere. Yeah, a couple of other talking points out of those two really revolve around attendance. Uh, did, they, did they announce an attendance at Red Bull Arena last night? Did not see one, and the, were the folks from Santos from Laguna were on TV. Pretty much, yeah. and uh, you, you got to give the, the Santos Laguna folks credit for for making the trek, and I also give them credit for going shirtless in 28 degree weather at points. Yeah, that's that's insanity. Uh, we did hear a little bit. I saw a couple tweets about. The chant that will not be named, that should not ever happen, happened. And, it did. And that's that's yeah. not cool. Um, it's a process, and it's going to take time because it is part of the soccer culture, and it, it just has to stop. Um, just have to be vigilant about it. The, the weather was awful. Uh, 28 degrees, was that what it was around kickoff? At, at one point during the match, I, okay. I just remember hearing the, the announcers for Univision mentioning the temperature and then getting your cutaway of the Santos fans who were, were celebrating Sans kit. <laughs> it's, I know it's cold. I know that's bad weather, but that attendance was really dreadful. And we've mm-hmm. talked about the Red Bulls attendance issues before. Anytime there's an excuse for people not to show up, they don't. It has to change. It has to change uh, now. It's just not acceptable in the context of where MLS is going. Uh, Houston had a different issue. Houston had a, a pretty good crowd, but it was primarily a T-Grace crowd, and yep. I think the team targeted that, knowing that their fans weren't going to buy up those tickets. And, and I've seen some criticism of that from Houston fans, but I don't really have that much of a problem with it if the fan base is not responding in that way now why are they not responding is a bigger question and if you want to look at marketing and you want to look at community outreach and and those types of things those definitely need to be looked at in houston because i think we've all kind of shaken our heads about that team which is a a fun team to watch on the field that stadium which is a very nice stadium it's a great place to go see a game and it's just hardly ever full. Houston seems like it could be one of the great markets in this league. It's just not really tapped right now. Yeah, and I think part of it has to do with the recent run that the team has been on. They haven't been very good the last couple of years, but, I mean, they're fun to watch. Uh, I, I Houston was, going into this round, I thought Houston was the most likely of the MLS clubs to get knocked out. Uh, it, Tigres is a really, really tough draw for them. They had to make the most of the home leg. Uh, as you said, it felt like they were kind of hanging on for a while in the second half after, as John said, a few pretty nice chances in the first half. Uh, and at one point, I think it, we were watching during dinner last night, at one point I, I even said, I think Houston might get a result at, out of this, but even a scoreless draw was not going to be enough. Um, Red Bulls, that, that's the, the real stunner to me. Uh, 2-0. I, I just don't see them going down to Santos and getting two goals, uh, let mm-hmm. alone the three they would need to, to get through. So, 
You know, a lot of pressure now on Atlanta United. Uh, I, I don't think they really feel like they're carrying the flag for MLS. I don't really get that vibe. But um, it's basically down to Atlanta United now to get just something positive here tonight in Monterey, put themselves in a position where they can win uh, next week at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. You feel pretty good about SKC going up against Independiente of Panama, a.k.a. Kai. Uh, Los Vikingos, um, but then the, the the problem could potentially be you could have Atlanta United and SKC in the semifinal, uh, and then one of them would have to play uh, Santos or Tigres in the final. So, um, you know, missed opportunity last night. I think more for Red Bulls than Houston. Houston did all they could. That was kind of a road game for them at home. There are a lot of Tigres supporters in that building last night who apparently drove up there, according to uh, what I've heard from some. Yeah, I guess the uh, the roads were clogged between Monterey and Houston last night. Um, 450 no miles. Yeah, no Tigres fans, you know, in the uh, greater Houston area, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, anyway. Um, it, it's just it's a bad night for MLS in this tournament. We've seen these before. It, it's something that we've talked about it a lot with Atlanta in CONCACAF this year, experiencing it for the first time. It is so much more difficult than you know until you've done it. And even for teams that have done it, I mean, the Red Bulls went to the semis last year. They've lost Tyler Adams. And that's not an easy piece to replace, period. It's not an easy piece to replace at this point in the season where you're still figuring that out. And it's going to show up in these types of games. And meanwhile, on the other side, you have teams that are like literally in the middle of their current season. It does have an impact. Um, I'll keep saying it. I really feel like if MLS wants to perform at its best in CONCACAF Champions League, either MLS is going to have to adjust its schedule or it's going to have to lobby CONCACAF to move things around just a little bit. There's not a lot of wiggle room when you dig into it because of the playoffs in Mexico and a lot of the Central American countries. But, I mean, let, let's let's be real here when you're talking later stages of CONCACAF Champions League. You're talking about how it affects MLS and how it affects Liga MX. And Liga MX, midway through their season right now, they're not going to want anything to do with CONCACAF and their playoffs. MLS didn't want anything to do with CONCACAF and its playoffs and its lead-up to the playoffs. That's a big reason why the group stages went away and you don't have stuff in the fall like you used to. So what kind of room do you have to work with here? ML, or Mexico also has the Copa MX that takes place midweek, so you've got to deal with that. I think it'll be a little bit better if MLS moves its season start up like they're talking about for next year. If you're starting your regular season – second week of February, third week of February, that gives you a little more time. Um, I really think the teams that are in CONCACAF need an extra week or two, maybe more in preseason to try to at least get a little more up to speed. But it's always going to be difficult if the schedule is like this. If you're facing teams in midseason form and you're one, two, three games in, it's just borderline. It's not impossible. We've seen teams get there before, but Everything has to fall into place, and if there's any challenges along the way, it's tough. It's very tough. Now, Tigres has a big match this weekend against Atlanta United's opponent, Monterey. Tigres now had, can relax a little bit more about their second leg against Houston. I will be very curious to see what Monterey does tonight. Uh, manager Diego Alonso said they'd be going with the first choice tonight. They're not. They're just taking it game by game. They're not worried about resting players for the Clasico with Tigres on Saturday. I wonder if maybe that's changed a little bit after last night's result because you know Tigres is going first choice completely Saturday night, and they can go second choice against Houston in the second leg and have some first choice guys in reserve in case things get squirrely. I wonder if Monterey is going to look at this now and maybe rotate. One of the big talking points in preseason for Monterey and Diego Alonso was that they have two players in every position. When he says first choice, he's not necessarily saying the 11 who have played the most games because they've rotated a good bit this season already. He's got, in his mind, er, he's got 18 to 20 first choice guys. So he can mix and match a bit 
the biggest question always when it comes to Monterey, and, and John, I know you watch Liga Emekis and, and know yep. uh, Funes Mori quite well. Mm-hmm. The biggest question for Monterey is always can they produce chances and produce goals if Funes Mori is not in the lineup? And that's probably the one that everybody's waiting to see the team sheet on tonight. Yeah, and uh, you you have that, and then you have what happened in the previous round. And don't think that that tape didn't get out either. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when when you have a, a team hang around as long as Alianza did, and, you know, it's, I, I'm not going to say expose, but uh, there's probably a better verb in that. It's sit there and, and show everyone else. Okay, yeah, yeah, they completely and totally frustrated Monterey. So you know that tape got out. You get to take a peek at how they did things. You know, does uh, you know, does does Atlanta United drift five toward the back? You know, is it something that looks more like a five four one? Those kinds of things to frustrate Monterey in their home leg, so that you can get back to Mercedes Benz and take care of business and you know keep things close in the first leg. So. Yeah, for me, it's look at that tape from the previous round and sit there and what can you pull from it that fits your dynamic to sit there and get out of a, a BBVA Bancomer with a result. Felipe Cardenas did a good job monitoring Diego Alonso's press availability last night. I was not there. I was with Atlanta United, and, and the press conferences were going on simultaneously. Alonso did make a remark about how they don't typically see a five-man back line in Liga Emekis, and he expects Atlanta United to play with a five-man back line. Now, that could still be 3-4-3 with the wing backs drifting backwards, but I really believe – I'm going to take Diego Alonso at his word that they're going to start with a first-choice lineup tonight. I think the most ideal scenario for Monterey would be if they could get a couple quick goals, put the match away early, and then get – if Funes Mori is in, get him out. Uh, get Pabon out, uh, even at half time if they can. Um, there's a big difference, as you know, guys, uh, between playing 30 to 45 minutes and playing a full 90. There's really even a big yep. difference playing 60 minutes as opposed to a full 90, a huge difference. Um, but I'll take him at his word that they're taking this one match at a time. And the reason why I say that is that the media attention last night at the, the Estadio was staggering. I and mean, the CONCACAF told us they have 140 credentials for this match tonight. Just media credentials. Uh, only three to Atlanta, by the way. So you can imagine uh, the, the level of media attention that this is getting here in Monterey, one of the largest cities in Mexico. Uh, what it's getting nationally, it'll be nationally televised here tonight. And a lot of the questions that Frank DeBoer was getting yesterday, and Leandro gonzalez Pires as well, kind of dealt with, do you see this as a measuring stick for MLS against Liga and Mackeys? And I think that's, without having a good understanding of Spanish, I think that's the big storyline down here tonight. Um, you know, it, I guess in a way the two matches last night could have been seen the same way, but Atlanta United is the Campeones. So th- this is really the true test. You've got one of the top two teams in Mexico against uh, the best team from 2018 in MLS. And, and that's I-, I almost feel like Diego Alonso might feel a little bit of pressure because of that. Pressure to play uh, a first-choice group. But, and I'll take him at his word that he's taking it one match at a time because that's exactly what Frank DeBoer said last night. They are taking it one match at a time. And they will make these evaluations uh, you know, every day, basically. Does it feel like, Jason, it's been only two or three days since Atlanta United played a match as we sit here this morning in Monterey? To me, it does not. feels like it's been a while. Yeah, it does. Um, I think Alonzo is feeling that pressure. Uh, This is a Monterey team that hasn't lost in 2019. Uh, The record is good, but the play has not been at the level the fan base expects. They have four straight clean sheets in all competitions, uh, in league and CONCACAF anyway, uh, not including Copa and Mackey's. And they've only scored three goals in those four games. One against Alianza in the second leg from a penalty. Two long-range bombs against Chivas. And that's it. Uh, you, were sh- you had a clean sheet, uh, nil-nil against Puebla, and same in El Salvador against Alianza in the first leg. It feels like a team that has a lot of talent but isn't hitting on all cylinders just yet. 
And Alonzo is a guy who's going to come in and build the defensive foundations first. And he took over last summer. So this is his second tournament in Mexico, uh, second league season. There's pressure on him because this is a huge club. And this club was built. And the roster specifically in the last couple of transfer windows was built to be able to win the league and win CONCACAF. I, I love that type of difference that we're seeing. Um, Atlanta United talked about it a lot with their, their acquisitions in the offseason. It's about being able to compete in CONCACAF and win the tournament. Monterey thinks that way. Tigres thinks that way. The big clubs are thinking that way. I want to see more think that way about all right, we're here to win every tournament that's in front of us. That's what we do if we're a top club. Monterey has that pressure, so they've got to find a way to balance it. Can they go into this tonight with that you know, referendum kind of hanging over their head about Liga MX and MLS? They hear all the talk about Major League Soccer, and they see it, and they especially see Atlanta. They would like to, to humble Atlanta a little bit and show, no, the best soccer in this hemisphere is still played south of the border. But it's very hard not to look ahead to Saturday for them. It's very hard not to have that in the back of your mind about T. Grace coming into your building on Saturday, who's one point ahead of you in league play right now, even though you haven't lost. That's a lot of pressure. And then you're also thinking about, okay, then you're going to Atlanta, a place you've never been, in, in a place you've never played in, and you'd like to have enough of a lead there to feel at least a little comfortable going into it. The first leg sets the tone in these types of series. Who's going to set the tone tonight? That's the question. I think T. Grace set the tone late against Houston. They're they're fine. They're in good shape. Santos Laguna set the tone in a couple different ways against the Red Bulls. I don't know if New York can open things up enough to get the goals in Mexico they need. Kansas City wants to set a tone quickly against the Cinderella story in Dependiente right now. And Atlanta needs to find out how to set the tone tonight. That could be defensively. That could be frustrating Monterey. That could be with an early goal like we saw in the second leg against Aridiano. They have to set the tone, though. They've controlled possession in every match so far. That's not necessarily setting the tone. That's what they have to do tonight. Any which way they do it, and there's a few different ways they can, they have to set that tone as early as possible to control this match and not let it get away from them early let's take a break it's a wall pass wednesday so you guys chime in on twitter at soccer down here let us know what you're thinking let us know what you're going to be looking for tonight uh let us know how excited you are about this this is atlanta's first i think huge international match um concacaf champions league uefa champions league copa libertadores these primetime games have a different feel. They have a, a very special feel around them. And I'm excited to experience this one in Monterey tonight. Let us know what you're thinking out there on Twitter, at Soccer Down Here. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it. Drowned it again and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual insurance company, country preferred insurance company, or country casualty insurance company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life 
Young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. March 6th. It's Wall Pass Wednesday. We're in Mexico, two of the three of us. Jason Longshore, Mike Conti from Monterey. John Nelson Woo-hoo. from Decatur, Georgia. What's up in Decatur this morning? How's the weather? Absolutely frigid. Thank you for asking. It's pretty cold here. It's not frigid, but it's it's cold. It's definitely no, cold. It was... Uh, it was uh... I'm trying to do math in my head quickly. It was probably... Minus four, as I was taking uh, somebody out for his morning constitutional this morning. Minus four, oh, really? Wait, centigrade. Oh no. oh, no. Okay, I was about to say. It's like what happened? Low twenties, <laughs> man. Yeah, no, no. Crazy. Low twenties, low low twenties this morning here, and uh, I've been looking at all of your your photographs that have been posted. Through uh, through the IG and various other social media platforms that the two of you have been doing, and uh, I, I will say this, Mike: the the coolness factor of having you standing as close to the pitch as they would let you at BBVA Bancomer. I, I just thought that that was that was really sweet to to have that kind of a moment last night that you oh, were posting yeah. on social media, reporting live. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, it was really exciting, and I could have gone all the way out to the halfway line if I wanted. We had a, a chaperone from Rayados. Uh, two of them, actually. I have to just say, and we'll, we'll talk about this more when we have more time, the friendships and brotherhoods that are forged through international soccer are, are something that I never really anticipated seeing. And, and we really had that experience at Erdiano, as we chronicled on this show. And um, Chris Winkler of Atlanta United PR and I, along with a CONCACAF rep, uh, got to the stadium way before training yesterday because we were trying to figure out where to broadcast. Uh, and we had to scout out some booths, and we found a great one, by the way, way better than the one we had in D.C. But um, the the PR people mm-hmm. from Rayados uh, said, you know, while you're here, would you like to take a tour? We'll show you everything. Uh, and and they did. I mean, they went completely out of their own way after 5 o'clock down here in Mexico to stay late uh, and give us that experience and that hospitality. And uh, they, they were just wonderful people. And all of them were were friendly and tried to speak English with us and mention how much they're looking forward to this match tonight. So I, I just want everyone to know that's listening to this how appreciative I am of uh, of that kind of treatment. But yeah, I mean, you, you walk into the stadium, and again, John, it, you don't have anything else like this in MLS other than Mercedes Benz Stadium. So when you walk yeah. into the stadium, even when it's empty you know you're walking into a big match. You know, e- even with all the, the seats empty, you know the atmosphere is going to be big. This feels big. I would even say if Atlanta United goes all the way to the Club World Cup, that the atmosphere is going to be bigger tonight than it would be in December out there uh, because often you don't play in, in full stadiums out there. And, and and this is the cool part about Atlanta United playing big international matches. Uh, if you go on and you play SKC or Independiente, it's not going to be like this. Even if you go on and play Tigres in the final, it'll be different. It'll be because this is modern, you know, th- this is a big American style modern stadium, but th- the opportunities to play in a in a stadio like this are extremely rare. And and quite frankly, I I expect and hope that it will bring out a certain level of emotion and a certain level of play in Atlanta United that maybe we did not see Sunday night. Yeah, I agree with that. T. Grace will have something to say about the the big feel for sure. And uh, this is kind of cool being in this town. So, you know, we got here to the hotel uh, last night. Um, I, I was lucky when I got to the airport. I was getting ready to start looking for an Uber and figuring that process out in Monterey and then I see Darren Eels in the uh, customs line in front of me, and, and he's like, yeah, you can bum a ride with us. That's cool. So we we rode over, and we were talking about the Red Bulls game and all that, but we got to the hotel just in time for the Houston Tigres game to start, 
and there were a lot of people just in the little hotel bar area watching it, and you could tell they were definitely Tigray supporters. And then we went over. There's a mall connected to the hotel, and we went over and had dinner, and games on every TV. It, it's a big deal. Um, I love that. I, I love the feel that this is a big night in in Monterey. And it's not just because, oh, it's a game against an MLS team. It's CONCACAF. It's Champions League. Monterey is a club that has a great tradition in this tournament. They're expected to win it. They're expected to win the thing. But they also get a chance to play against the new team that everybody's wondering about in Mexico. What is this team in Atlanta, Georgia doing? It's pretty cool. Um, It's pretty cool to be part of this. There are some nerves now after yesterday's press conference. Frank DeBoer mentioned Julian Gressel has an ankle injury. He is questionable for tonight. And Tyler Rice, doubtful, sorry. Tyler Rice kicks us off on a wall pass Wednesday. Says, extremely nervous about tonight with Gressel out. He's doubtful. It's not completely ruled out. Um, I think going 90 would be pretty difficult. Uh, We'll see if he's available. But Tyler asked, could we potentially see Jeff played as a center back and Miles Robinson moved to play as a more defensive right wing back? It's a tough ask for Ambrose to play on his weak side, especially against Rayados. So Monterey is going to play a 4-2-3-1. That's, that's Diego Alonso's game plan. That's what he usually does. Um, if it's Funes Mori up top, you're talking about a big, strong forward. Good speed, but he's not a, a, a burner Jeff in that type of role, if Jeff's you know matched up with him, I think would be fine. And this is an idea. You would lose some going forward for sure. But if you're going to sit back in more of a 5-4-1, it's not a crazy idea. You don't have a lot of options on the right side right now. You know, Miles would be one because of his athleticism, although you're putting a young player who hasn't played there in an unfamiliar role – Is he ready for that? And that's something that we don't see training every day. We don't know if he's worked there. We don't know if that's a possibility. Mikey is a possibility there. I think there was a lot of criticism about Ambrose in D.C. I didn't think he hurt you defensively at all. He didn't give you as much going forward as a Gressel or Escobar does, although he did a little bit. It was a little more possessed from a deeper spot and not try to get to the end line. But defensively, I thought he was fine. Playing on the weak side defensively isn't that big of a deal. A lot of it depends on the game plan. And we talked about this yesterday, John. Like, you know, how much can you vary things up at this stage of your development? Are you ready to come in and play a, fi- a true five man back line? Are you going to go with the 3 4 3, but just maybe adjust and be a little more conservative? Um, that's going to be the plan. How active can your wingbacks be in the attacking end? Or are you going to rely on on Barco, Pitti Martinez, Joseph to create things on their own a little bit more centrally? Or do you think you can get some help maybe just from the left side? It's going to be tough. Uh, without Gressel, it does change things a bit if he's not available tonight. Yeah, and Percy Herrera kind of follows up in that vein, asking that if is it Gordon Wilden for Gressel, and would this be a repeat of starting Bello on a big stage? Yeah, it's a possibility. I think that's an even bigger uh, risk, just because Gordon Wilde hasn't played at the MLS level yet, but he's been in the 18 every time. Uh, he's a player that obviously Frank DeBoer has taken a liking to. We saw him in preseason play as a wing back. Um, he hadn't really played there in his career. He would be more attack-minded, that's for sure. Um, If he can do enough defensively to deal with Monterey's outside backs getting forward, because that's something that they they thrive on, if he can do the defensive work, that'd be great. That's a riskier one to me, though, just because he hasn't been in that role before. But I also think, if you're thinking about Miles Robinson as a right wing back with Jeff as a center back, that's almost too defensive. Because I, I... have we seen Miles Robinson pumping across ever? Uh, maybe, no. maybe more of like from a longer distance out. Right. Not, a, not like a true get to the end line to put in a cross. He hasn't played in that role. Right. I mean, if you're going with that, it is a true five four one, and it's very, I think, almost too defensive. I think this is Mikey Ambrose's game. Uh, I think just with the options you've got right now. I could see Gordon Wild absolutely playing Sunday against Cincinnati if Gressel is not available. Um, I think that's a more comfortable spot at home against an expansion team. 
uh, by process of elimination now, you, your options with any kind of experience at this level, it, it's Mikey Ambrose and, and really no one else. Um, so I and and I agree with Jason. I, I thought I didn't really understand all the the negativity about Mikey Ambrose after Sunday's match. I, I don't think he was a liability. I don't think he made too many mistakes. Um, no, I thought he was defense first, right? Which is what he was out there for, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the plan. And, yeah. That'd so for plan for me, too. yeah. And so that that's how I'm I'm looking at this. Lineup wise, is a three four three where you get the, the the wingbacks drifting back to help out defensively, and I could see Mikey getting more minutes over there on the right hand side once again as defense first. And I know that we're about an hour away from the predictions segment, but you know my prediction is going to be closer to the under than it will be the over. Yeah, and I think Atlanta would be happy with that. Um, Look, these things happen. This is part of the game. You're going to have guys get injured, and right now you've got two guys injured that play the same spot, so you have to adjust. Um, the hard thing is that it's not the summer where you're comfortable in the way you're playing, and it's still early, so you don't really have the ability to deviate shape too much and come up with a completely different tactical setup. That's that's a bit of a, a challenge for Frank DeBoer tonight, but I think he has three options. If you want to go very, very defensive, it's Miles Robinson sliding out wider on the right, and you're going to look like a true five-man back line. It could be Mikey Ambrose, which gives you a little bit going forward, but more defensive, and it could be Gordon Wild, which is going to give you a lot more going forward, and you worry about the defensive side. On the road, first leg, you're probably going to lean to one of the first two. You're going to want to keep this conservative and keep this alive going for the full 180 minutes. Uh, Allison Cupertino says, it, it sucks Gressel may not play, but if we're hanging our wins and losses on only one player, we're in trouble anyway. All isn't lost. He's one of our best without question. We'd all rather have him play, but we have a whole team to support tonight. That's, I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to in these situations. You're, you're never going to be at 100% full strength. I, I think it's almost impossible to be that even at the beginning of the year. Injuries happen. Things happen. You have to adjust. You built this team with depth for this type of reason, and we'll see who steps up. There is another option. There is another option to all of this. Hit me. And I, I, I want to give credit. I think it was Felipe who may have either brought this up or was answering a question about this. Do you look at Ezekiel Barco as a offensive-minded right wing back tonight? That's a big ask. Um, I've been really pleased with his defensive work in the middle. Um, I like his, his work rate right now. I think if you ask Ezekiel Barco at this point to run through a wall, he would give it a shot. Can he do that against uh, potentially a Mexican national team left back overlapping that you've got to defend? It's going to be a big ask. Um it's possible if you did that, then you'd make room for Tito Vialba inside the, the 18 or in the 11, and you'd probably look a little more. It's a 3 4 3, but it might turn into a little more of a 3 5 2 with Pitti Martinez dropping a little deeper, Tito up running with Joseph. It gives you the ability to play a little more direct. But that's a huge ask for Barco. Um, these moments. Sometimes that opportunity presents itself and you learn something that you never knew about a player. Barco's never played in that role. He's never had that much defensive responsibility, and that would be my concern. But what we've seen in these first three matches, I would think he'd be up for it, and he would give it, he would give it a go. Is he going to be effective? I don't know. Um, maybe that would be the most – well, I think Gordon Wilde's probably the most aggressive one just because of the lack of experience. So – if I'm ranking them in terms of aggressiveness, Robinson would be the least aggressive, Ambrose would be next, Barco would be next, and then Gordon Wild would be the absolute wild card. No pun intended. If you're going to go for it. Uh, Tafka asked about Dion Pereira. He is not here on the trip. I think he's going to play mostly with the twos early on. We saw him in Chattanooga, John, and, and he looked good, but yeah. as a wing back, I don't know. We saw him there play as a winger, up up high and also as a number nine I don't think he's ready to play as a wing back yet um I like his 1v1 no. ability but we haven't seen very much of him just yet right and that's why you know I'm I'm steering Dion Pereira toward ATL UTD2 
and uh, subtle plug season starts this weekend. And ESPN Plus, you know, yes, ESPN Plus. Get your subscriptions. Hartford Athletic coming to town, and obviously we'll kind of be getting into that a little more as the the week goes along as well. But uh, Tofka also said that he has to say, you know, he's impressed with our CCL opponents this far. Rediano and their fans, class on and off the field, and Monterey appear to be the same. And, and this was a point that I wanted to get into, you know, once again with the two of you that, uh, you know, Mike, you were talking about it as well that. This tournament is giving Atlanta United a bunch of firsts. You're in a tournament for the first time. You're heading to play in a place like Costa Rica and play Arediano for the first time. The first time that you're getting a Liga Emeekis opponent to to show what you've been able to build, what Darren and Carlos and everybody been able to build in these last couple of years. While yes, if down the line they get to do, they do get to play a Tigres. This is just one of those opportunities where you sit there and say, this is a season of firsts, and to be able to have this first in Monterey, this first shot at a Liga MX opponent, I think that it just, it once again, it reinforces everything that's been built over the last couple of years, but just the, you, you're adding all of these different things to test where you are as a club right now in year three. Yeah, these these types of experiences are are pretty special, and it's just part of the building process. What I've loved to see is now, you know, you have the Costa Rican Costa Rican media who's had a chance to experience Atlanta United. They're a known quantity there. Now the uh, large media core in Mexico and especially in Monterrey has a chance to see Atlanta United firsthand, and it sounds like quite a few will be traveling up to Atlanta for the match next week. I believe over a hundred credentials have been issued for that one too. Uh, it's a pretty cool time. Um, all that's great, but you have to get the results on the field. And, and uh-huh. this is something where I feel like the league has been in the past where it's, ah, oh, this is nice, this is wonderful, this is good, and then they get spanked on the field and, and nothing changes. That respect right now, Atlanta United's earned it. They have to keep it, and they have to keep earning it with quality play in the, in these matches. I think this is the second biggest match in Atlanta United history. Yeah, I agree. I really do. Next to the MLS yeah. Cup final. Uh, and it, I think here in Mexico, Atlanta United comes in here with a lot more credibility than other MLS clubs, not only because they're the champions, but also because of Pitti Martinez's presence. Uh, and what's interesting is if you look at Rayados, they've been – Built in a similar fashion to the way Atlanta United has been built. A lot of players from Argentina, a lot of players from River. In fact, their PR guy was was joking with us. They think of themselves as River North. Um, you know, uh, one of Barco's old teammates from Independiente. <laughs> so there is, um, I, I think Atlanta United comes in here and there's a level of respect given to them by not just the media, but maybe the, the supporters here as well that, Houston would not necessarily get that SKC would not necessarily get and and that's a testament to what Darren and Carlos have built here because they've assembled a team with world-class players look there's a there's a thing about being one of the grandes and Tijuana you know won a league title not that long ago but they weren't looked in the same way as a Monterey as a Tigres as a Chivas as the as the big Mexico City clubs um, you have a smaller club that'll pop up and do well. Houston, oh, it's it's nice, it's good, it's 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 wonderful that they're here. Atlanta is seen as a grande. Um, the LA Galaxy are seen as a grande, a, a big club here. They're seen as a big club in the region. I think Toronto is seen as a big club, although maybe that's being questioned at the moment a little bit after this year's run. But after what they did last year, I think they have that potential, and after the roster they built, I think they have that that mindset um i think new york city was looked at that way with david via some of it is is temporary based off players that you sign and i've been impressed not just to see the the love for pitti martinez but for joseph and we kind of wondered what the attention would be for joseph here he's well known he, he is a known quantity around here so when you're one of these big clubs you get a different level of respect and you have a different level of expectation as well that goes along with it. That's why when you see bad results from these teams, even if it is a short term thing, you see managers go, you see players go. There is a high level of expectation. 
there's a high level of expectation tonight in this match. I think both ways. If if Atlanta is controlling the match early on and Monterey is not creating anything, the fans are going to start whistling. You're going to start to hear that from the Estadio BBVA Banco Mer tonight. If Monterey is rolling early, the crowd will be roaring. They're kind of waiting to see about this group with Rayados because they haven't been as dominant as they typically are. And that's a question mark at the moment when it comes to Monterey. Let's take a quick break. You guys have more questions, too. We'll get to those after this. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. And we're back. Hour number one from Monterey. Soccer down here. Wall pass Wednesday. You guys are throwing some questions at us. We will do our best to answer. Uh, Heath Bradley throws up a suggestion of Tito Vialba as a right wing back. Not horrible defensively. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think he's another one who's going to give you that work rate on the right side. It's just who's going to be the better defender if you're looking at him or Barco. I would probably lean to Barco if it's down to the two, just because Tito would give you a little different look up top, and it would give you the option to play a little more direct. And that was something that uh, Felipe mentioned in his most recent piece over at The Athletic, was Frank DeBoer is a little different than Tata Martino in that regard. He's okay if there's nothing on for Brad Gazan or for the center backs. Just play long. Just just. Give it away and let's get win it back and let's let's be smart defensively. Don't force anything in our own half. They want to play in the other half. So Tito up top gives you a little bit more in that regard of just being able to play and play over the top and let him chase things down and and be that mosquito that he can be at times. I'd lean Barco though, just because then you get Tito up top. Barco just from what we've seen right now, and this is honestly just a gut feeling, I think he would put in the work that's needed over there at the moment. Yellow Dog with a comment, um, following up on Allison's mention about it's not about one player here. Uh, Yellow Dog's been troubled by the extent to which some have pinned Atlanta's early season problems on Escobar being out, like he's the key to everything. Um, I haven't really seen that. To be honest, I mean, I'd love to have Franco Escobar and his team. I think it gives you a few more options. But I'll go back to the first part of it, early season problems. I think there's some overreaction if, if that's the mindset, that it's been a bunch of early season problems. You have controlled possession every time. Uh, you created chances in your first two games, most in the second one. Um, on the road, you've lost two games. At home, you won your game. 
the goals you're conceding, there's been a lot of talk about you know bad defensive setup and bad defense. The goals you're conceding haven't been typical goals, in my opinion. You've got two off of set pieces, one a free kick, one a corner. You've got one that Brad Gazan misplayed after a weird hop off a wet field. You've got a bad individual mistake from Leandro Gonzalez Perez that there's just nothing anybody can do after the mistake is made. And you have one pretty solid buildup from Aridiano where they stretched the Atlanta back line and took advantage of it. That's it. You're not giving up bad goals where you look bad defensively as a unit. So you haven't gotten results in two games, but I'm honestly not as troubled about where this team is, especially defensively. I'm okay with it. Yeah, we talked about that yesterday, and I, I've been trying to hammer that home on 92-9. Um, I have no problems at all with the way this team is defending right now. If you do want to critique the way that they have not been able to convert, especially in the final third, that's valid. That's an early season problem where you've taken Miguel Almiron out and you've plugged in Pitti Martinez. It takes time to build that kind of chemistry. Um, you know, now you almost have to reset a little bit with Julian Gressel being out from a chemistry standpoint. So I, th- I think people need to be a little bit patient. Um, you know, if they were to be clean sheeted by Cincinnati or clean sheeted by Philadelphia, uh, two teams that did not defend very well in their opening week games, th- then I'd be a little bit more concerned. Uh, but even in the, the second leg against Aridiano, we saw that the ingredients are there for this to work it just needs to come a little bit more consistently now um but i i'll I'll maintain that the way they looked sunday in dc was way way better than they looked in houston at the beginning of last year we know how last season turned out yeah it worked out okay uh carlos rangel asks is the 18 going to be the same for this game as it was against dc not necessarily. Uh, I'm not sure how many players traveled. I think it was more than 18 who traveled for the two games. So there could be some changes. Um, it's been with Gressel's injury. That's probably the biggest question mark is, is he in the 18 or not? And we'll just have to wait and see. That's probably going to be a game time decision. I think the other name you might see creep into the 18 tonight would be Kevin Kratz. Uh, the team tweeted a photo of him training on Monday it looked like he was a full participant the open portion of training that we saw last night at uh BBVA Bancomer Stadium he was training again uh I I think Kratz is probably going to get plugged in now the question is is it as simple as just a one for one Kratz goes in Gressel comes out or do they do a little more maneuvering than that I think Gordon Wild was in the 18 on Sunday uh, so it might be just as simple as that. That would be a name that I'd keep an eye out for tonight. Question from Eric Schwartz. Uh, John, start start with you. Mikey's the obvious answer here about the right wing back situation. Folks seem to forget that he's a starting caliber outside back in MLS. He would have been the starting left wing back in the postseason over McCann if he was healthy. Do you think Mikey's a starting caliber outside back in this league? No doubt. I mean, I, I look at how he – integrated last year with Miguel on the left and to, to build that kind of a relationship, you could see when the two of them were in sync, how, how things were working and how Mikey could spring things for Atlanta United offensively. So, you know, obviously everybody is still sitting there and staring at Mikey on the right, just because it's an atypical position for him. But yeah, I think that he is a quality starter in this league. I think he is a starter in this league. And I think that, once again, it just comes down to, to reps and getting him out there. So Nathan Pugh asks, and, and this is something, Mike, we've talked about a good bit, uh, how much does salary cap affect MLS's ability to compete with Mexico? I can only see a fourth designated player edition helping. Definitely So bad. does L.A. <laughs> well, they tried. They, they gave it a good go, but uh, <laughs> that was shut down, thankfully. Um, I agree. I think it would, but I don't even know if it's as simple as just a fourth designated player. I think it's more about the difference between player 10 to 18 that Mexico has over MLS. And we'll go back to Diego Alonso. feels like he has two starters in every position. I think Atlanta would be pretty close to saying that. I don't know if there's another MLS squad that would be willing to put that out there. 
that's the biggest question. The other side, too, is this always gets brought up. And when it comes from Atlanta, I think it's a different conversation. When it comes from an L.A. Galaxy when they were in CONCACAF Champions League back in the earlier 2000s, it's a different conversation. When it's coming from other ownership groups that either don't want to spend or coming from clubs that haven't spent intelligently, uh, they're not maximizing what they have to work with, period. I think Atlanta's pretty close to maximizing all the resources they have, and they've hit the, the type of players that can compete in this league. To me, I think that's more of the issue. It is it, You look at the top clubs in MLS, forget what you saw last night, please. Otherwise, this argument is invalid. Um, Atlanta United, Red Bulls, LA Galaxy, Toronto unhealthy, um, DC maybe on the fringe. You know, those are clubs that I think can, that can compete with anyone in Liga MX. The the problem is top to bottom, Liga MX is better as an entire league than MLS top to bottom because I don't know if Vancouver can compete against a Liga MX club right now, at least at the, the top of it. Uh, I don't know if Colorado would be there. They're better, but but I don't know if they would be there. Uh, Cincinnati, I don't think, would be there. New England, I don't think, would be there. I, I think that's, that's more the issue is you need to have all 24 MLS clubs sharing the same kind of ambition that you have in Atlanta, L.A., Toronto, uh, some of the bigger clubs in MLS. And, and th yeah, the fourth designated player would absolutely help, but, I mean, there are MLS teams right now that have one designated player. Quite a few of them, actually. So that, that I think, is what needs to change first. And there's some who have designated players that are not really designated players in terms of salary and stature, too. Um, that's the biggest difference is Atlanta's designated players. You're talking about, you know, nearly $30 million in transfer fees paid for PT Martinez and Ezekiel Barco. These are big, valuable players that other teams just haven't decided to go down that road. Um, I don't know. I would maybe disagree that top to bottom Liga MX is, is so much further ahead of MLS. I think it's really in the middle where the difference is. The top, there is a difference. I think Atlanta is a team that can compete with the top teams in Mexico. Um, I don't know how many other teams are there. It's that middle group. I think bad is bad. I think the bad teams in Mexico are bad teams. And, and yes, it would be bad they, teams they in MLS. There's a big drop-off. But the depth of top teams and the middle-tier teams in Mexico are very good. Um, I mean, if you look around Mexico, you look at the big clubs. So we've talked about it from, from the MLS perspective. Who are the big clubs? In Mexico, you've got you know the, the Mexico City clubs, the Club America, Cruz Azul, Pumas. You have Monterrey and Tigres. You have Chivas. You know, that's a, a pretty solid core. That group is better than the group of big clubs in MLS. I think there is a gap there. I think the next tier, there's a gap. The bottom tier, they'd be bad in either league. They're just – it's just bad. Oof. So – yeah, I mean, I, I watched some uh, Chiapas games back in the day, some Jaguares games, and ooh, some bad soccer. Uh, not Maybe not quite as bad as Colorado last year, but bad. Let's take our break here. We'll come back, start hour number two with more of your questions on a wall pass Wednesday. If you, you've got questions about CONCACAF Champions League, about the lineup tonight, about big picture stuff, whatever you want to get into, throw them our way on Twitter, at soccer down here. We'll be right back. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. 
If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States and the Ad Council. You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all.
that they're understandable, obviously understandable. Um, you know, you look at Chicago, you look at New England, th- those are the two specific examples that, that have been pointed out. I almost think with those two clubs, you need a complete refresh from the ground up. New name, new logo, new stadium, an in-town stadium, hopefully. Chicago, I don't know if that's ever realistic because of the the albatross that they're in in Bridgeview right now. Um, it, New England might be a little bit different. I think there is some ambition there from Robert Kraft to get this right eventually. But I think you need to be in town, Mike. Yeah, I totally agree. New England. Totally agree. Uh, but, I mean, you're talking about Boston, which voted down a chance to host the Summer Olympics because they didn't want to spend public money on uh, – on a new track and field stadium there. So it, in, in Massachusetts, I can't imagine it's going to be all that easy to get any kind of public funding for a new stadium. Uh, and I don't think moving into downtown Hartford or Providence would be the answer either. But I, no. I, I think I think you have a couple different levels. Those are two clubs that might need just a, a total refresh from the ground up. Uh, in the case of Houston, Dallas, you know, the, these are markets that uh, – Colorado – Markets that could be really, really good, they just don't have it right now. I feel like if Houston brought in the right player, like a Chicharito one day, that could be transformative for them. Colorado is tricky because they're so far out in Commerce City, but Stan Kroenke owns the land, and and that's where their academy is. Every market is different. Getting it to the point where everyone is in Atlanta is going to take maybe decades it's going to be a long, long grind, and it's not as simple as, oh, if Chicago goes out and wins an MLS Cup, it's going to be totally different for them. I don't think it would be at all. I had some connection issues, so for people who are, are back hearing us now, um, we're talking about Tafka's question about how do clubs, especially the older clubs, replicate what's happening here in Atlanta? How does a Chicago, how does a New England do it? Um it's not, yeah, I agree. It's not just as simple as winning an MLS Cup or making one big signing. It takes time, and it takes an extended commitment. You're going to get people in for a big event. You're going to get people to buy that jersey. But if Chicharito comes to Houston and is there for a year and a half or two years and then moves on and you didn't win anything and then you don't replace him, I think that, that initial buzz is going to go away very fast. It takes an extended commitment. Now, from a newer team, that's a lot easier to accomplish because you don't have bad times to overcome. For an older team that's had a lot of bad times, that's tougher, and it takes longer to show that commitment. And I, I mentioned it when we were having some of the connection issues, John, the, the, uh, the wrestling analogy. You know, yeah. you look back at like a WCW, for example, and they were seen as a they had a very strong perception as a southern brand that was small time in small markets. And when they blew up the NWO angle and they became a big deal, that didn't happen overnight. That was a couple of years of building to where then they became the biggest thing. And then when they started making mistakes and it went away, it went away fast because they hadn't established that long-term success. So it took time to get people on board. Then people were on board. Then they went away fast when it was obvious that it wasn't lasting success. That's, a, that's something that these existing clubs that have been around for a while have to realize. You can't just pop the building, pop the rating with one signing, with one trophy you have to demonstrate to your fan base that you're in it for the long haul and you're not going away. And that's something that New England and Chicago fans, I don't think they really believe that right now. No, and you can have that seminal moment. You can have Hogan turning heel at Bash at the Beach. And you can sit there and say, okay, how do we go from here? And then that's where you have the WCW building, the NWO angle, and... Then they decided when they got into the Monday Night Wars that throwing money at a problem is the solution. Throwing money at a problem if you're Chicago or New England isn't the solution. It might be a short-term fix in bringing in high-priced talent or whatever. But for long-term sustainability, you have to look at your infrastructure and you have to look at your approach. For Chicago, Mike is right. First and foremost, it's Bridgeview, but you're stuck there until the mid 2030s, and that's They're a long way to away. Say from... some things about well, maybe not. So, 
I would say right. hang tight on your stuck there. I, I think Bridgeview wouldn't necessarily mind being out of that deal either because it's putting a big drain no. on, on their city finances. So there could be a negotiation out of it. I, I'm just I'm back to what Garber said the other day about different markets and different opportunities and, and he kind of mentioned Chicago in that maybe it's not as hopeless as you think. Yeah, we can hope for all parties concerned, but Chicago's got to put a winning product out there consistently. That's number New one. England. Yeah, New England's got to put a winning product out there that isn't just okay. Because when you're 60 minutes away from downtown Boston and it's easier to fly into Providence to get to game site than it is to drive out of Boston, especially maybe North End or somewhere inside the perimeter, and you want to go see a Revs man, uh, you want to go see a Revs match, and you've got to go through all of those hoops. You're not going to do it, and you either need to be very good or very bad. Because if you're just okay, that's worse than being one of the two extremes. Because no one's going to care about your mediocrity. I still think that the Revs need to be in town. I think they need to be separate from the Patriots, at least in the sense of Foxborough. And I know that uh, Brad Friedel and the front office have been bringing in players and they're trying to, to turn things around on the pitch. But you've got to be relevant too, in that market. They're spending money there. So yeah. I, I think the the old story about the revolution not spending is changing. I, I really do. Um, the stadium's going to be the toughest piece because Boston's not exactly an easy place to build. Uh, New York City's going through this as well. But if you're going to do this, that's that's what you have to do to change it. If the Revolution build a stadium in Boston, it's going to feel like a brand new franchise. If NYC builds a soccer specific stadium inside the five boroughs, it's going to feel like a rebirth. And they're pretty young to begin with. Yeah, across the those, street from City. Yeah, those things are critical, and, and they have to get done in those markets. Other markets have different challenges, but for me, for the older clubs to get on a level of what Atlanta's doing, even what a Seattle's doing, what other clubs are doing, you have to demonstrate a long-term commitment to success. That's the only way it's going to change, in my opinion. Um, Derek Creighton with an interesting one. The only way an older fan base may change with an MLS 1 and 2 in the fear of dropping. Then again, it may just be the city and it's time to move. If you get to that point, if you get to a you know, 40 teams, 36 teams, 38 teams in MLS, and you go to two divisions and you have your own promotion relegation with inside MLS, you're going to have to get your business partners to buy in. You're going to have to make some changes. But if you do, then, yeah, it creates a different dynamic. That's true. Um, how much is it going to be is the question. You know, if Let's say Colorado. So, okay, if Colorado, instead of being a bad team at the bottom of the table, is a bad team fighting to stay up, does it change it? Do the fans come out? Or do the fans turn on them even more? I don't know. And that's something that we just really have not experienced in this country. So I don't know what the reaction is going to be. I do think that the soccer audience is far more savvy than people give it credit for. But that's a new wrinkle. And that would be a very different just set of circumstances. I don't know if that would change it or not. Um, I do think the league could be headed in that direction in the long term, the long term being the key there. I think promotion relegation is decades away at this point, and it would only be within MLS. It would not be a true wide open promotion relegation. I just don't think it's going that way. I think other countries are coming around more to what the U.S. is doing than the U.S. going to a wide-open promotion relegation. I mean, we're already seeing teams, John, in, in the NPSL Founders Cup, the pro side of NPSL, who are dropping out before the league starts. You know, you have a third division that's starting up this year with NISA that we don't know who the owners are of the teams that are in it. You know, no. it's, it's not as simple as just, oh, do it, and I can start a team, and they'll be in the MLS in, in three years. No. no, that doesn't happen, and it's not going to happen, and I don't think that's good for anybody because then you're going to get teams that are in over their head and they're going to go out of business. Uh, you're already seeing that across the pyramid as it stands now. It needs to be done the right way, and it's going to take decades to build that. I, I don't, Derek, I don't know and if that changes the older fan base. That would be a really interesting case study, and, and we're not going to see it for a while, but I wonder if that would spark a bit of a fire in a Chicago, for example, 
of them trying to stay up. It would be a different story that we've never had, and I don't know how it would resonate. Yeah, I, I, but, I think you know, keep. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, keep an eye on USL because of what we're seeing with the championship in League One. So, if you're looking for a shorter term magnifying glass, keep an eye on USL and see what they do with with their franchises over the next decade, decade and a half. I think the only thing that Pro Rel does to energize an older fan base is if you're sitting in the danger zone with two matches left, it makes those last two matches a little bit more intriguing. But you have to get to the bottom to get there, which means you've got to set through a lot yeah. of bad soccer to, to get into the danger zone. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have just assumed that, that Pro Rel is going to absolutely transform MLS and, and make it so much more interesting and so much more intriguing. I think all it does is it, it adds a little bit of drama at the end of the season to teams that aren't very good. Uh, instead of concentrating on pro rel, let, let's get other clubs to the same level amb- of ambition as Atlanta United. That's how you're going to make this league better. Yeah, that's the first step. Um, the pro rel side of it's going to be a ways down the road. And I think we kind of all get down that road sometimes, that rabbit hole, and it's hard to, to get back out of it. So let's get back to the match tonight. Um, Adam, Five Stripe Stunner, says, Breck Shea's played a lot of minutes in a short time with very mixed results. Shea has experience in CONCACAF Champions League. He's not a lock for me. I think maybe the Gressel injury makes him a little bit more of a lock just because his, and and the Bellow knock, because Bellow has not played since he took that knock in training. I don't know if Bellow would step in tonight. I think if Breck Shea was not going to be in the lineup, it'd be Mikey Ambrose on the left chances are Mikey's going to be needed on the right unless you're going to go with one of the other alternatives we've put out there I think Breck's in the lineup tonight and I think you want to see the Breck we saw in Kennesaw rather than the Breck we saw in DC he was active in DC just didn't really create much yeah and got a little unlucky with some block crosses uh I I Breck Shea well I mean I I think Breck Shea is really your only option right now at least in this match tonight and Again, his level of experience and international experience is helpful. Uh, don't discount that. I don't think he played all that poorly in D.C. I don't think he lost a spot because of anything that happened in D.C. All right, let's take a quick break. A couple more questions. We'll get to those on the other side. Then we have Doug Robertson from the AJC joining us at 1030. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Apple and Associates personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience supporters of atlanta united faction and inter atlanta youth football club if you've been hurt in a wreck contact steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24 7 at 404-377-9191 the initial consultation is free A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. And we're back. Soccer down here. Quick segment before we get Doug Robertson from the AJC on the line. 
A uh, question about yellow card accumulation. Thomas Jewin uh, asks if it's two cards and then you sit a game, and it is. Uh, he says LGP better be on good behavior tonight. Pitti Martinez better be on good behavior tonight. He's on the yellow card tightrope. Uh, Monterey, do you remember off the top of your head if they had anybody? I think they had at least one. I, I can get it. I can get it. Yeah. We will get it. That's all good. Efforting. Yeah, we'll we'll double check that and we'll let you know. I, I know that there's somebody on the list from Monterey, but I can't remember who it is off the top of my head. Um, George Bellow is the other one for Atlanta who's on a yellow, but again, he's not expected to be in the team tonight. So that will be okay. LGP and Pitti Martinez are the two you have to keep an eye on. Um, Eric Schwartz, a late Kratz free kick goal to sprint out of town with an away goal would be Vunderbar. Yes, I totally agree with that. Um, I wonder where Kevin Kratz might fit tonight. I wonder if he's fitness-wise where he could be from the start, um, who he might replace from the start, because I don't know if you're, you're looking at him at replacing Remetti or Nagby. I think that pairing has been pretty good, and Frank DeBoer mentioned that he was pretty happy with the fact that Instead of, as we saw last year, often the center backs having the most touches and the most passes, it was Remedi and Nagby who were controlling that in D.C. Even though they weren't, there wasn't as much creation in the final third, you're playing more in the midfield and less in the back. But uh, Monterey on yellows, who is it? Uh, Funes Mori is one of them. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Sanchez, who scored for them, uh, had the PK goal. And uh, Barrio, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, Barrero. or Barrero, yeah. uh, Barrero. You know, j- just came into them from Paraguay. Yeah. Uh, so those are the three. Funes Mori obviously is the big one. Uh, Sanchez is a big one too. Um, Sanchez is a, is a player who takes their penalties, takes a lot of their free kicks. He was, I think, in the 2018 Apertura, he was actually their leading scorer as a center back, which is kind of bonkers, but it happens. He has four goals this season. Yeah, and, and keep in mind, cards don't wash out until the final. It's a lot like the MLS Cup playoffs. So you've got a long way to go now if Atlanta United should make a run in this tournament. Uh, it, it's four more matches basically now for Bello, Pitti, and LGP to be on the tightrope. It's a long time. Uh, Thomas Jewin's throwing crazy lineup choices at us. Uh, he asked about a midfield of Nagby, Remetti, Lorenowitz, Barco. Um, so that would be Nagby and Barco as your wingbacks. Um, it's not crazy. It would be extremely narrow, I think, because of Nagby and Barco's, you know, tendencies. They're going to want to play a little more central. Um, I don't like it against Monterey in that they're, they're a good team out wide. That would be the problem I would have with something like that. Um, it would take a lot of work to get there, and I just don't think you have that time right now. So you kind of have to go with, with what you have. And, and I think it's going to be probably Mikey Ambrose on the right side, Breck Shea on the left, and Nagby and Remetti in the middle. I think that's what you've worked on the most, and that's where you're going to be the most comfortable at this stage. If you want to go wild card, maybe late you go Barco as a right wing back. Maybe you go Tito as a right wing back or Gordon Wild as a right wing back late if you're looking for a goal and you feel like there's one to be had. That's something else I think comes up at times, and, and it's something that, I would want to mention here is that sometimes you get into these games and you can feel as a manager, if you're in the bench, if you're one of the assistants, you can feel, okay, there's a goal coming here. We can go for this. There's an opportunity here. Let's, let's be aggressive with a substitution or you know what? We're not getting anything out of this game. Let's limit the damage. It's the 70th minute. We're not going for this now. Um, Houston last night, I mean, we talked about it watching it, Mike. We're, we're watching that game, and you could see Houston falling back deeper and deeper. That's where maybe Wilmer Cabrera, even though it runs a little counterintuitive, has to say, we're out of gas. We're done. We need to keep it scoreless and see if we can steal something next week. Otherwise, we're going to lose this game now. And I think Frank DeBoer, at, at some point tonight, is going to have to make that decision of, I've got an opportunity here to get an away goal, or... We're under siege, and we have to preserve this to take it back to the Benz with a chance. Probably this is a good time to point out that Frank DeBoer has a lot of Champions League experience managing with Ajax, Europa League uh, experience managing. So these are decisions he's had to make on the fly before, and I'm sure it's something he's probably considered again. This is where you like to have Frank DeBoer as your manager. 
Yeah, it's 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 key to have gone through these types of two leg situations. It, it's very very important to uh, have that experience because you have to be able to read the game. Wilmer Cabrera doesn't have as much of that experience, and it, it would have been a tough decision at home to decide. You know what? We're done here. We we need to shut down and 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 just close this up and try to get out of here at square at zero zero. That's a tougher decision. On the road, it's a lot easier. If you get to the 60-minute mark, and you're probably going to start thinking about it at halftime, all right, is there anything here for us? If there's not, you want to limit damage. And if you get out of here 1-0, you're in a really good spot next week because you do have to consider that Monterey is going to be coming in off of playing Tigres in a very emotional game on Saturday. If you hold serve, even concede a little bit tonight, and you take it back to the bends to face a tired team, a little bit of an emotionally drained team next Wednesday, you're in an unbelievable spot to go through. You can't lose it tonight. You can't let this get away from you tonight. That's the key for Atlanta. Um, we saw Ajax and Real Madrid with some craziness yesterday in a, in a two-leg series where the underdog who lost the opening leg at home then went into... Real Madrid's house and just demolished them. Crazy things can happen Oof. in a Champions League. But you want to give yourself the opportunity in the second leg. And, and I think that's the key here. Atlanta, I, I don't think there's any way Atlanta wins the series tonight. I, I just I don't see a 3-0 win on the road here. I, I don't see that happening. Um, I think there is a chance Monterey can all but win it tonight. If they win 3-0, if they win in a blowout, if they keep Atlanta scoreless and four straight clean sheets. They have the defense to do it. And they put a bunch of goals on the on the board. That's going to be tough next week to overcome. Um, I think Atlanta is explosive enough to have a shot, but you don't want this series to get away from you tonight. And there could be a time where you have that tough decision to make. We'll see how that goes down tonight. This is a little bit of the unknown where we're at right now. MLS defending champions against, I'd say, the most powerful team in Mexico right now. Heavyweight matchup. We'll see what uh, what Doug Robertson thinks about it. We'll see what his prediction is. We'll see what John's prediction is. We won't get a score prediction from Mike, but something he's looking for tonight, something that he is predicting will happen. We'll get that after the break. Stay with us. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Got issues with youth or high school sports? Positive Coaching Alliance can help. PCA is a national nonprofit working to transform youth and high school sports so that every child has a positive character-building youth sports experience. PCA provides live and online workshops to train double goal coaches whose first goal is winning and whose second, more important goal is teaching life lessons through sports. PCA also has workshops for parents and high school student athletes. For more information, please visit positivecoach.org. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. This cat makes me make art. He's always motivating me to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. He's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Keyboard Cat, YouTube star and shelter pet. Amazing adoption stories start in shelters. Start yours today. Visit theshelterpetproject.org to find a pet near you. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Soccer down here. We we have called all the Dugs we can find. We don't have Doug yet. There he there is. There we go. Perfect timing yeah, as we come out of the break. Doug nice. Robinson from the AJC joining us. You planned that, didn't you? I've got 
all sorts of troubles with this hotel and it's wireless and stuff. So I apologize for that. <laughs> no, it's all good. It was perfect timing. It was the Kool-Aid man rushing through the door at the last minute. It was it was perfect, Doug. We appreciate it. Um, I'm looking more and more like the Kool-Aid man with all the food and stuff I'm eating down here. Hey, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to a nice Monterey lunch. I can tell you that much because I did not get there here until late. So we will uh, we'll figure that out shortly. But let's get into the match tonight. Um, the big news, obviously, Julian Gressel, uh, doubtful for this evening. We've talked about all the different scenarios, even some some crazy ones this morning. I mean, what are you thinking tonight at right wing back if Gressel can't go? Uh, I think they're going to go with what they know, and Ambrose will get another start. Um, I really just don't see another option that uh, isn't going to cause trepidation. Gordon Wilde played there in the preseason, but you cannot roll him out in front of 53,500 people in a Champions League game for his debut. Um, I suppose you could flip Shea and Ambrose and and – let Shea, with his experience, try to go up that right side and, and see what he can do uh, and move Ambrose over to the left where he's probably going to be a little bit more comfortable. But I think it's going to be the same duo you saw against D.C. United. I'm just not quite sure who's going to be on which side. Take it, John. We're not. <laughs> we might have lost. I, mean, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was typing yeah. the promotional tweet. Ah. No, I didn't travel. John, no, I was talking to travel, so he's not he's not available. Didn't know. <laughs> he's in frigid yeah. Decatur, Georgia, at the moment. Yeah, yeah no, I was typing the promotional cold. tweet as you're tossing it to me. But yeah, you know. now, Doug, uh, I, I guess yeah, let's let's go back since we you know haven't had you on since DC and kind of apply it to tonight. But I guess. What were some of your takeaways from the first match of the, the MLS season and having to do a quick turnaround and get ready for this, which was what was anticipated the entire time? It's going to be quick turnarounds, multiple competitions, and all of that. So I guess takeaways from D.C. that kind of apply to tonight. Yeah, my, my two big takeaways from D.C. is I, I really I didn't understand the starting lineup that Frank DeBoer put out. Um, it's obvious, or as I, I thought it was obvious after the game, that he really didn't give a second thought to rotating in a lot of different players with this game on Wednesday. When I asked him if you could explain why you rolled out such a strong starting lineup, he immediately thought I was asking, why didn't Pitti start? And after he was done, I said, no, I completely understand why Pitti didn't start. I was more curious why Barco didn't start, or, or why Barco started, or Medi started, and Nagby started, all these guys that I think are going to start again on Wednesday. And he, he tried to give an explanation. It, it didn't make a lot of sense to me um, about explosive plays and things like that. Um, but that was my, my first takeaway. So I'm going to be really curious how much this team is going to have left in the tank at around the 70-minute mark tonight if it's the same starters at D.C. Uh, we saw what can happen at Houston uh, when a Mexican club kind of gets the bit between its teeth last night. They can score a couple of goals pretty fast. Um, and the other was, again, just how uh, ineffective the offense was, how disjointed it looked just like it did in Costa Rica again uh, and a little bit against uh, LAFC in the preseason. Um, I just don't think they've quite figured out this 3-4-3 three, three yet you know they played well against Herediano at Kennesaw State but as Jason has said a couple of times Herediano was disorganized already in that game I think they sensed their coach was likely gone uh, so there were some issues there um, Atlanta United is going to need a totally complete performance tonight to avoid uh, carrying a bad deficit back to Mercedes-Benz next week Doug, how big of a match is this for Atlanta United in its club history? I, I think it's right behind the MLS Cup final as far as an opportunity to play in in, in this stadium against this team, uh, one of the best teams in Mexico. It, we certainly heard last night from the Mexican media this is kind of a, a little bit of a measuring point for MLS against Liga MX. Do you, do you put this at the top of the list of biggest matches in club history? 
I think I agree with you. I think it's second behind MLS Cup. Um, and if it goes well, then the next game might even surpass MLS Cup. Um, I know that sounds weird because there's not a trophy on the line, but when you're going against one of the better clubs uh, in Liga MX, which is kind of the next bar that MLS is trying to surpass in terms of quality, you need good performances. Even a loss, if Atlanta United can play well, I think is a good indication of what you know, Darren Eels and, and Carlos are trying to put together uh, with the team. Uh, but it's hugely important. If they, if they go out and just get run off the pitch, which I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Monterey hasn't done that to a lot of teams this year. Um, you know, it's just going to be kind of a, a signal that it, there's going to need to be a lot more time uh, and, and energy kind of put into developing the product on the field. Not that it's not great for MLS, but again, you know, if you're trying to compete against Liga and Mekis, it's just going to take more time. Well, and that's oh, and, and and I figured out last night why I couldn't find the press gate, Mike. <laughs> it's why not on the con. It's not on the concourse. It's behind <laughs> the. It's like there, there's the concourse, and then there's like this garden thing that you can walk into. That's where the press gate is. Oh. I would well, have I never we'll, found I, it in a million years, I guess if we'll not for a, a Mexican right? journalist. Yeah, oh. so you, it's around that same area, but you kind of take a step back into that kind of gardeny area okay. and walk around to your right, and there's the press gate. That's actually very handy <laughs> to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Advanced scouting from Doug Robertson as we're trying to get into the stadium tonight. I yes. Like it. Um, let, let's go bigger picture with, with where you just were, though, Doug, about the the measuring stick and, and what it means for Atlanta United. A- Atlanta's kind of in an interesting spot. This is their first time in this tournament, and it's third year as a club, so you don't really have a lot of you know institutional history to lean back on. But right. you're also being looked at as the you know, flag waiver for Major League Soccer right now because you have changed the dynamic of what MLS teams do and what they can do. And you've definitely grabbed the attention of everybody in this hemisphere. And now that burden of expectation is on Atlanta. It, it's a tough spot because, you know, you see a New York Red Bulls that went to the semifinals last year in this competition and everybody, you know, raved about their performances. The series with Chivas was... You know, a really fun one to watch with the styles of play. And then they have been there and done that, but they get, you know, smacked back last night by Santos Laguna. I think there's a lot of, I don't know if the the players for Atlanta United feel it. I think from a bigger picture, there's pressure on Atlanta United to represent Major League Soccer well. Yeah, it's really an impossible situation for Atlanta United. Um, I go back to Gerardo Martino talking about, the playoffs and he said basically it takes time to develop the right experience and mindset to succeed in tournaments and the first year at Miami United didn't have it the second year they did this is the first year of the Champions League but the logic still applies it would not at all surprise me to see Atlanta United bounce, get bounced out of this round but if they qualify it for it the following year and they can keep the same core together I think they probably could make a deeper run I think they have the talent this year to make the deeper run, but you know you got to know how to use that talent and deal with all the things that a new tournament and new surroundings and stadiums will throw at you. And Atlanta United is still working on that, um, you know. And they haven't played before fifty three thousand, except for maybe one time. Uh, I don't know what that was uh, in their two year history on the road, and that was at Seattle two years ago. So this is going to be different. And for the first time in my memory of covering the team, I have yet to see a single Atlanta United supporter on my flight or in the city. I'm sure there's some here, but I haven't yeah, seen any. So there's not going to be a whole lot of visiting fans to kind of counterbalance what we're going to see from uh, the supporters of Riados tonight. Now, I mean, this is going to be like Atlanta United playing a match as an opponent at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. That's... Really, the only thing I can compare it to. I think there will be maybe a few neutrals who are River Plate fans who will want to see Pitti Martinez. The problem is Rayados, they have a lot of River players as well. So it's um, th- this is tough. Th- this is going to be an incredibly challenging environment for Atlanta United to play tonight. 
But I also think it underscores that you don't necessarily need to get a win tonight to keep a pulse. If you come out of this 2-1 right. and you have a road goal, that, that's still a good result, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, as DeBoer was saying last night, uh, two to one or even three to one is a lot better than two to nothing. Um, so even a loss, even if it is two to one or even three to one, Atlanta United can turn that over at Mercedes Benz. It's going to be a lot more difficult than it was against Herediano, but they can turn it over. They can't be shut out, I think, tonight unless it's one to nothing. Um, and expect to be able to advance to the um, semifinals. But it, it's going to be a good game. I mean, Monterey, as their journalists were talking about last night, from, from what I understood, they're not scoring a lot of goals. They're not really putting anyone to the sword a great deal. So they're kind of curious about how Monterey is going to come out in this one too. They also have that gigantic game against Tigris on Saturday. People want to complain about it Lund United schedule. Try playing Shivas last week. Champions League on Wednesday, and then Tigris, their their rival, uh, a few days later. They've got an even tougher schedule than Atlanta United. So then, Doug, let me let me peel it away from the game a little bit, and and I know that you've had some tremendous photographs about your experience and making all of us insanely jealous about what you're able to do at, at six or eight hour increments with with your meals, but. Being in Monterey, once again, if I had told you three years ago that you would be posting those kinds of pictures and being in these kinds of situations, what would you have told me? Oh, I, I would have been surprised. Uh, I wouldn't have thought it impossible, uh, but I would have been surprised. And it is a testament to the work done by everyone at Atlanta United. Um, but, you know, as they've said many, many times, they want to win the trophies. And so just coming down here isn't going to be good enough. They, they need to get some sort of positive result, even if it's a loss, if they can get that goal uh, for this trip to be considered as successful as I think they want it to be. DeBoer and, and Leandro, to me, um, seemed very confident that, that they can get at Monterey's defense. Um, it's just kind of keeping Monterey out is going to be the bigger challenge. It's going to be an interesting matchup because, as you mentioned, Monterey's not really scoring a ton from the run of play right now. Uh, they've scored two just golazos against Chivas from distance from Pabon. Um, penalty in the Alianza series, lots of set-piece mm-hmm. goals. Set-pieces will be an issue again for Atlanta United tonight. That's something you're going to have to try to avoid. It's going to be tough on the road. I'm I'm really curious to see the mindset from Monterey, and it's felt like here lately maybe those distractions of the league schedule, of the attack, you know, getting kind of quiet, those things have been creeping in. The Alianza second leg here in Monterey, they did not look like a powerhouse team. That they looked shaky. They looked really on the ropes in that one, and. I'm wondering if Atlanta punches them in the mouth early, not even necessarily with a goal, but with a you know a great break or Pitti Martinez nutmegging somebody and creating a chance in the final third. Um, we kind of joke about stuff like the nutmegs from Pitti Martinez, but it can it can definitely put a team on their heels. And if you get just a moment like that early, just enough to make Monterey question and say, "Hey, wait a minute." We've got a matchup here, and, and we're not the aggressor here. We need to figure out how to deal with this. I don't know if, if they have a, as much self-confidence as you mentioned Frank DeBoer and Leandro gonzalez Perez have right now. I think Monterey's questioning themselves at the moment. Uh, yeah, I, you got that vibe from their journalists last night. Um, they aren't – well, you know, part of it is they just don't know what Atlanta United has. That's part uh, of it, sure. This, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, they're not playing as well as they played in the Apertura, uh, for example. Um, but they have just a lot of talent. What's their, their transfer value is almost $80 million American dollars, I think, I looked up the other day. Yep. Um, and their, their front can definitely, you know, they can score a lot of goals quickly. They haven't done it yet, but they can. So Atlanta United can't have any 
moments like it did against DC United with, with Parkhurst getting beat by Acosta to the spot on the corner kick or, or, you know, that, that Guzan getting handcuffed by that shot by Acosta, um, who should have been man of the match. I have no idea why Bill Hamid was man of the match, but anyway, um, yeah, they just, they can't, they've got to have complete focus as Jeff Lernowitz talks about, uh, pretty frequently, um, with the team they they can't relax one bit. I would agree. Um, now the hard part. And before we get into, to match predictions, uh, we'll have to tweet at Jarrett Smith and get him to throw one in on Twitter. Uh, we don't have a prediction from him ahead of time. Mike's not going to throw a score prediction at us, but what's something that people can look for tonight in your opinion? I'll go back to what I've been saying. I, I think early onslaught by Ray Otto's tonight. I, I think they absolutely, it's, it's a huge priority for them to put this match away early so you can get guys like Pabone and Funes Mori out of there and keep them at least somewhat fresh for that match against Tigres this weekend. So I think Atlanta United is going to be ducking and covering for the first 30 to 45 minutes. The longer this match goes scoreless, the better I think it is for Atlanta United. Yeah, I'll completely agree with that. Uh, John, yeah. you want to kick us off on score predictions? Sure, because pretty much my score prediction, which I've been waffling back and forth on uh, for the entirety of the show, is, and I think that Mike has finally convinced me of one of my two options. I'm going to go goalless draw. Ooh. Wow. Ooh, exciting. It could because be a exciting goalless of, draw. Just well, kidding. I mean, just because of what we didn't see against Alianza, and what it took for them to score against Alianza, and with the injuries that Atlanta United's having to deal with, with Gressel with a knock, Bella with a knock, all that kind of stuff, and, and so I'm thinking that if it, I think Atlanta is is going to pretty much defend and counter and, and uh, take their opportunities when they can. So I'm going to go goalless draw. All right, Doug, what are you thinking? <sighs> I don't know. I, I, uh, <laughs> I know it's it's a tough one. Um, <laughs> probably I I think it's going to be two to one Monterey, uh, which is a a good result. That's a great for result. Atlanta United. Yeah, um, that was my other choice. I, I just got to make sure I'm watching the game and not just flabbergasted by the beauty of the stadium. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's really something else. Uh, for those fans who, who haven't seen it, make sure you watch the game on television and hopefully the cameras will pan around and you get to look at it. Uh, it it's just, it's a gorgeous place to watch a soccer game. 2-1 Monterey win. That'd be a good result for Atlanta United. Um, I, it, this is a really hard one to call because there are so many unknowns in it. I'm actually going to go a little counter to what Mike said. I think Monterey is going to throw a lot at this early, but I think they're going to get caught. I, I think Atlanta, speed-wise, can take advantage of that and hit them on a break. I think P.T. Martinez gets a goal here tonight. I mean, Atlanta scores first, oh, wow. and Monterey comes back and gets one, and we finish at 1-1. Um, and I would take that and run out of the building. I would be uh -huh. very, very happy with that. I think Monterey gets one off a set piece. They're just really struggling unless it is a, a golazo or a set piece right now. They're just not really creating a ton. They're not – well, the interesting thing about it when you look at how Monterey approaches it, they're not a team that dominates possession. They're a team generally that concedes possession. And that's where I'm maybe the most – confused about how this is going to go because we know Atlanta wants to control possession it might be in their best interest tonight not to but can they do that at this stage of their development I don't know if they control possession uh, can they do it in a way that is yeah. safe and I don't know if, if Thought, I'm Atlanta United I, I'm I'm bunkering bunkering and trying to counter let Pitti and Joseph try to use their speed uh, to crack Monterey on the counter uh, but just bunker, 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 particularly with your wing backs who just really did not play well at DC United. I don't know if I even want them venturing forward for fear of getting caught from cut, cut out, caught from behind on a, on a Monterey counter. I I'm bunkering and, and that's what I'm doing. 
yeah, I'm I'm not necessarily bunkering, but I'm looking a lot more Defending, like a yeah. base of five two two one, um, as opposed to three four three as a base. I think if if a wing is open, you take it, but you don't force it. You know, if if Monterey, for example, um, makes a run up on the left and Jesus Gallardo gets down, but Atlanta takes it away from him and he's exposed. Yeah, then you go down the right and you try to take advantage of that. But you don't force it and you don't try to dominate possession to get everybody forward in those spots because you don't want to get exposed. Um, that is going to be a little different, and we'll see how comfortable Atlanta can be playing that way at this stage of the season. It's it's tough to vary things a lot right now, and we'll see how much variation Atlanta can have in the way they approach this match. Uh, Doug, I know um, outside of, of having great meals, I know you're pretty busy. What do you have the rest of the day over at AJC.com and, and at Doug Robertson AJC on Twitter and Atlanta United News Now on Facebook? Oh. <sighs> Well, I, uh, I, I published my digital blog uh, on my trip to Monterey last night, and it looks like the Riados fans, I picked up a couple hundred of those. Uh, so they really we all it. are. That's kind of cool. Uh, so that was pretty fun. Uh, I did uh, uh, my predicted 11. Uh, I'm considering writing something about DeBoer talking about Ajax knocking out uh, Real Madrid, uh, DeBoer being, of course, an Ajax legend and, and former manager. Um I've got to go back and see if I can make enough sense in the quotes uh, from that. Um, and then uh, I'm probably going to do a little sightseeing. There's supposedly um, where I was kind of in the downtown part, which is uh, the more um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, urban part of Monterey. There's a, another part uh, that is more high end that someone said I should go there and walk around. So I might do that for a little bit today and then come back and take a nap. Uh, and get ready for uh, tonight's fun. Yeah, a lot of time to uh, kill before a 9 o'clock local kick. Um, we keep getting these in CONCACAF, Mike. Uh, yeah, I, even the 8 o'clock Atlanta time kicks are kind of tough. You're just sitting around all day waiting for a match to happen. I think the weather here in Monterey, I mean, if anyone's coming down today, uh, it is a little better. Uh, I'm looking out the window right now. I, I can kind of see mountains as opposed to the last couple days. But uh, – uh, they were saying it might get to near 60 today. It was only 43 degrees Fahrenheit here yesterday. I mean, that's unheard of for Monterey, one of the coldest March 5th days they've ever had. So uh, hopefully, Doug, we can get out and explore a little bit and uh, have some of the local food and uh, have a, a good kind of easy night tonight from our journalistic standpoint because we know the Wi-Fi is plentiful and they've got a very good press room. There. <laughs> yeah, we get TVs at our feet. How cool is that? Yeah. Like it's a little different than hours. the last uh, road match in the competition. Just a little. Slight, slightly different. Slightly different. Slightly different. But, uh, slightly yeah. different, but also a new experience as well. It's going to be fun. Uh, Doug, thanks for taking the time today, man. We appreciate it. We'll see you tonight. Thanks, guys. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, be good. Adios. All right, we're going to take our final break, come back, wrap everything up. Final questions, throw them at us on Twitter, at soccer down here. We'll be right back. Today's show is presented by Avalinsky & Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. 
Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Welcome back. Final segment. Soccer down here. Match day special from Monterrey, Mexico. CONCACAF Champions League quarterfinal first leg from the Estadio BBVA Banco Mare tonight. It's a 10 o'clock kick. It'll be just after 10, probably 10.05, 10.06. Uh, you can watch on Univision Deportes in Spanish. You can watch on Yahoo Sports in English. You can listen on WAOK. Uh, in Atlanta, you can also listen on the Atlanta United app and the radio.com app. And we'll be live at 930 with the Five Stripes countdown. Uh, it's going to be a busy night. We'll, we'll file a, a report on Twitter here in a little while, too, uh, once we get out and about um, as we're killing time. There's some Champions League to watch this afternoon, so that'll be kind of good. At least we have something going on. Um, find a good lunch spot we'll find a different lunch box i missed out on the one you guys were talking about yesterday so we'll see if we can find somewhere new to uh explore this afternoon uh we have something for you guys to explore if you're looking to get tickets for the cincinnati match and the monterey match next wednesday andrew baker loyal listener uh, is in germany he, he can't make it so he is put his tickets up for raffle again he did this for mls cup we raised, what, $1,500 for soccer in the streets for MLS Cup. Now you're getting a, a two-pack. You're getting two matches Sunday and Wednesday in this raffle. Uh, we just tweeted the link at soccer down here on Twitter. Uh, get your tickets. We're going to pull a winner on Friday show, uh, late in the show. Um, same deal um, on tickets. All the proceeds benefit soccer in the streets and their local Metro Atlanta program. So... Uh, try to win some tickets and and try to help the kids. It's always a a good combination. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think we have an update on how many tickets we've sold so far, but announced it yesterday. Uh, odds are still pretty decent. So if you're looking for tickets, get in on that and help out the kids at soccer in the streets. And we've got that. We've also got a coaching announcement scheduled for about a minute from now in oh, yes. Nashville, and it. Uh, I think we know for, the, for those who be. remember your soccer scene, yeah, yeah. For those who remember your soccer scene down here, uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss when it comes to Nashville SC. Yeah, they're following the route that FC Cincinnati is with Alan Koch continuing with the team from USL into MLS. It looks like Gary Smith is going to be announced as the manager for the MLS version of Nashville SC next season. I mean, this is an MLS Cup winning manager. I uh, won it in Colorado. It was a different MLS at that point. And that team, you know, it was kind of a weird year in MLS in 2010 that he wanted. It wasn't the most thrilling team. Uh, we saw him firsthand at the end of the North American Soccer League run for the Atlanta Silverbacks. And, and there were times when he had a healthy squad to work with that that was a really fun team to watch. But he had an incredibly thin squad. And when injuries hit, he just didn't have any options to, to turn to. So... Nashville, I, I think, has been solid. I, I think they've been very steady. I want to see them this year, now that they've invested a little bit, now that they've added a couple of MLS forwards into that group. They could be an explosive team in USL Championship in 2019, and that would really serve him well, I think, to, to have a team going into MLS that is scoring a bunch of goals. Because the knock on, on Gary's performances in Colorado was that it was a defensive team. They weren't really all that fun to watch. If he goes in with the players that Nashville SC has added this season, John, they could be a really fun team to watch in USL. And I think guys who can translate to the MLS level. Yeah. And it, like I said, it just reminds me of what we saw with, with FC Cincinnati last year in USL. And trying to make sure that they can put goals on the board and try to get as deep into the playoffs and bring home a championship in their last year to, to kind of push all of that momentum forward as they're heading into MLS. I'm looking forward to seeing what, what Gary trots out this season for Nashville SC. And 
you know, how, how is it going to translate, you know, and how, what's your holdover rate? How does it translate? What are you doing? And, and how are you making sure that folks are understanding and, and just reemphasizing that the MLS is a year away, but this is the first step in that process. And here's how we're going to represent the city and how we're going to represent the, the, the region with what we're going to do on the pitch. All right, let's close it out looking a little deeper at, at Monterey and, and some of the names to keep in mind for tonight. Uh, it starts with the goalkeeper, Marcelo Barrovero, 34 years old, veteran. Uh, he's played over 100 matches with River Plate in his career, and he played with Piti Martinez. You've got a couple guys who spent time at River with Piti. He won the Copa Sudamericana and the Copa Libertadores while he was at River. When Piti first got there, he was in that Libertadores winning squad wasn't a focal point, wasn't a key player, but he came in with some expectations and was kind of easing into the squad. So Barrovero knows what Pitti Martinez brings to the table. Uh, the left back, one of the left backs, Lionel Vangioni, is another one who will be known to a few players in this team. He started his career at Newell's Old Boys, actually. Uh, prior to Franco Escobar, Franco would have been a young academy guy if they crossed paths at all at Newell's. But Vangioni played at River with Pitti Martinez, spent a year in Italy with Milan, uh, three caps for Argentina. One thing that struck me digging into this, Mike, when you look at this Monterey team, 14 guys with national team experience in this roster, uh, quite a few Mexican internationals, but also players with experience with Argentina, with Uruguay, with Colombia. This is a very veteran-laden squad with a lot of international experience. And a lot of big match experience domestically as well. I mean, that, that's the thing that, that's so striking is that it, it almost feels like you're playing – it's not the same, but it feels like you're playing one of the bigger clubs in Europe a little bit. Uh, and it starts with the stadium and the atmosphere they have there, and then you look at the roster and the, the talent they've amassed. And, and some of these players have played uh, professionally in Europe. Um, I think – Pabon played in Portugal for a little while. Funes Moura, I think, played in Portugal for a little while. Uh, so it's not like this is just a, a river plate to Mexico pipeline. I mean, it, these guys are seasoned. They've been around the block. And that's not to say that Atlanta United doesn't have players that are seasoned and have been around the block, too. Uh, but if you look at the average age of the two clubs, it's actually kind of similar. But you, you just have guys who have played in a lot of big matches for Monterey and that's one thing playing in their home park that, that kind of scares you a little bit is you're not going to be able to go in there and, and, and you know expect to set the tone. You're going to be responding to what they do early. That's one of the things Diego Alonso has been uh, praised for is that ability to have guys like Nicolas Sanchez and, and Jose Basanta, two veteran Argentine center backs, 33 and 34 years old, uh, rotate and be able to make room for other players as well to get that experience because they have some young up-and-coming talent that will emerge and has been getting eased into this squad. And, and that's where I think Alonzo's done a, a great job building it. Um, Basanta is one that there's been some speculation. Maybe he gets back into the team tonight. He's only played a couple of times in this current season in the league. But this is a guy who's played over 200 times for Rayados. He's been the captain of the squad. Uh, started at Estudiantes before coming to Mexico in 2008. Went and spent a year with Fiorentina in Serie A. Came back to Monterey. Um, he's won two titles. He was part of that three-peat in CONCACAF Champions League. He was part of the 2014 World Cup runner-up with Argentina. Uh, he's been named best center back of the league twice. He, he's on the downside of his career, but... If you're going to rotate your squad and you're looking ahead to Saturday and you want to go first choice, you would consider Jose Basanta a first choice player, even though he hasn't been playing first choice minutes. That's the the benefit that Monterey has. Uh, Miguel Layun is a player that a lot of people do know from the Mexican national team. He joined the squad late in January. He's got a couple matches under his belt, two starts, played in the Alianza series as well dangerous player going forward and he can play on either side of the back line he's a guy that could slot in on the right or the left depending on what you need he's great on set pieces uh, good speed he's been part of a CONCACAF best 11 a couple of times and he's played at the last two world cups you added him for this run you added him in January because it's like ah, oh, we're good but we need a little more um, but you bring in those guys and you're playing next to 
two guys that are getting a lot of hype right now in Carlos Rodriguez, 22 years old. He, he's looked at as a, a future key component for El Tri. And Jonathan Gonzalez, who U.S. men's national team players have heard quite a bit about. Grew up in California, uh, played for the U.S. youth national teams, moved to Monterey in 2014 as a youngster, and promoted into the first team in 2017. He made the league best 11 in his first year, won a Rookie of the Year award, and he switched to play for Mexico. He made that one-time switch. Uh, He hasn't really played much for Mexico, but he's not eligible to play for the USMNT anymore. He's a guy who, you know, has played five matches this season. He can play as a six. He can be a box-to-box. Uh, just a very technical player who looks older than he is. And that's, the, that's where Alonzo has been real key, is getting these young guys to have that, that savviness from an early age because of the veterans in his team. We talked about Lyon being added. Another big addition was Maxi Meza. Um Argentine international was at the last World Cup, former teammate of Ezequiel Barco at Independiente, the most expensive signing in Monterey history. I believe it topped the scale at about $17 million U.S. Um, A guy who is similar to Pitti Martinez in some ways in that he loves to to get get you on the dribble. He's two-footed. He wants to run at players, sometimes holds the ball maybe a little too long. But a guy who can play on the left, play on the right, play in the hole behind the striker, can play as a second striker, just dangerous player all the way around. Um, Jesus Gallardo is another one of those guys. Uh, left winger who can play left back uh, with the national team. Osorio liked him as a left back. Where he stands out in this team is his strengths are his physical strengths. And that's not typical with Mexican players Usually you're looking at players who are technical, but maybe not as fast. He's fast, and he can get up and down the wing, and he can hurt you as a winger or as a left back. Um, (laughs) An interesting note on him, he has the fastest yellow card in World Cup history. 13 seconds into the match against Sweden in 2018. Uh, Caught caught Ola Toivonen with an elbow. I need to go back and see that because I don't remember. I remember, like, something weird. But I don't remember how that one went down. So uh, that's impressive. 13-second yellow card. And then we've talked about Funes Mori a good bit. This is the guy who won, I believe it was the first or second. No, I think it was the second, Sueño MLS. He was in Texas. Family's Argentine. He's in Texas. He's not part of the FC Dallas Academy. This was before Oscar Pereja changed everything with the Academy. Um, when Sueño MLS gets put into the academy, he's like, I'm not sticking around here. He goes to River Plate. Then he moves to Europe with Benfica uh, before coming back to Monterey. Um, leading scorer in the squad right now in the league. He's scoring at just a ridiculous rate. He's the guy. And they struggle when he's not in the team. Is he going to be in the team tonight? That's probably the biggest question on the team sheet. And don't forget about Dorian Pabon. He is the one who scored the two long-range bombs against Chivas. Uh, he was captain of the team there. Started his career with a smaller club in Colombia before moving to Atletico Nacional. There's quite a few Colombian players from Nacional in the squad. Uh, spent some time in Italy, spent some time in Spain. He's been here for a long time. He's one of those key figures that is Rayados through and through. You have that. You have the young talent coming through. This is as balanced of a squad as you're going to see in CONCACAF with superstars, with veterans, with young guys breaking in, this is the biggest test Atlanta United's ever faced, in my opinion. I think it's as strong of an, as an opponent that has ever been matched up against Atlanta United. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see how Atlanta responds. I can't wait to see how this plays out. Um, first 90 of the 180 tonight, 10 o'clock, just after 10 is the kick. You can listen on radio, radio radio.com, Atlanta United app, WAOK. You can watch Univision Deportes. You can watch Yahoo Sports on the app, on the desktop. And I think a lot of people are going to be keeping an eye on this one. Tomorrow's show uh, is completely up in the air because (laughs) we don't know what time we're getting back just yet. So it will be in the afternoon slash evening sometime. Um, Just stay tuned to our Twitter, at soccer down here and we'll let you know what we know when we know. But it definitely won't be a morning show. Uh, That's all we know at this point. So thanks, everybody, for listening today. Thanks for all the questions. 
on a wall pass Wednesday. Take a nap this afternoon if you can um, and get ready for some five stripes after dark. We'll see how chaotic it is. I kind of hope it's not. I kind of hope we have a very secure uh, draw. I'll be very happy with that. A boring draw, a John Nelson scoreless boring draw would be just fine tonight. Oh, this is a big one, y'all. <laughs> this is mm-hmm. really big. Um, it's exciting and can't wait for it to start. Thanks, y'all. We appreciate it. Mucha plata, y'all. Mucha plata. Mucha CCL fever, y'all. <laughs>